make no mistake about it the earth is alive for four and a half billion years it has been changing ceaselessly altering its outward form Existing as we do on our planet's seemingly solid surface, we live our lives oblivious of the relentless forces that continually shape and reshape the Earth. To us, more often than not, volcanic eruptions and earthquakes are random events, unpredictable and meaningless. But since World War II, geologists have come to a new understanding of our planet. This is a view of the Earth as we all know it today. But according to plate tectonics, a theory that attempts to explain movements of the Earth's crust, the Earth has not always looked this way. More than 200 million years ago, the continents looked like this generalized view. The single landmass is called Pangaea. Then, about 200 million years ago, powerful forces deep within the Earth began to drive the continents apart. What would become India began to separate from the southern portion of the landmass and head toward Asia. To the northwest, a new sea was forming, which would split North America and Europe. Then, some 40 million years ago, India rammed into Asia with a jolt that buckled the Earth's crust and thrust up the Himalayas, the highest mountains in the world today. For years, scientists have observed patterns in the Earth's seismic and volcanic activity. Scientists now know that this activity marks the outlines of plates, vast segments of the Earth's lithosphere that move on the semi-plastic asthenosphere beneath them. Most plate boundaries run through oceans. We must imagine the Earth without its oceans to see what the plates look like. In this simplified view, the Earth's 12 major plates are clearly visible. There are three basic forms of plate behavior. The plates can separate, a process called spreading. They can converge, a process known as subduction. Or they can grind past one another, translation. In November 1963, violent underwater volcanic activity was observed in the North Atlantic off the coast of Iceland. Spreading or creation, the first type of plate behavior, was taking place. Welling up from deep within the earth, magma spews from a volcano as lava. The lava cools and forms new crust. Beginning in 1963, ash and cinder rocketed into the wintry North Atlantic sky and rained back down upon the freezing water. Molten lava exploded night and day until an island rose up from the sea. The island was named Circe. For several years, the eruptions continued. From deep within the earth, the magma forced its way to the surface, creating new land where none existed before. Circe grew. Where the rivers of lava met the sea, the lava cooled quickly hardening into rock. Fire warred with water. 
Finally, the pressures in the earth abated and the lava ceased to flow. When the eruptions were over, Surtsey occupied nearly three square kilometers, a testament to the Earth's creative powers. A second kind of plate behavior is taking place off the west coast of South America. The process is called subduction. Here, the heavy Nazca plate plunges slowly into a continent-long underwater trench where the leading edge of the plate is destroyed. One result of subduction is the buckling of the plate behind the trench. The Andes Mountains run the length of South America's west coast. They thrust high into the heavens, forced up by the consumption of the Nazca plate as the American plate overrides it. Earthquakes also result from subduction. When people and towns are affected, the results can be tragic, with heavy loss of life and widespread devastation. The processes that constantly alter the Earth cannot be arrested. We must learn to understand and live with our changing planet. Splitting the state of California is the famous San Andreas Fault, here, the third type of plate behavior takes place. When one plate grinds past another, translation is said to occur. The San Andreas Fault. To the left, the Pacific Plate. To the right, the American Plate. For the moment, the plates have locked, causing enormous stress to build up. Earthquakes result when the lock breaks and the crust moves to reduce the stress. Ongoing studies of plate tectonics may one day make it possible to predict and minimize this kind of destruction. In the oceans of the world, scientists continue to make the first-hand observations required to test and refine the theory of plate tectonics. Here, they explore and study boundaries of creation beneath the sea. Ships such as the U.S. Navy's survey ship Bowditch are used to map these underwater areas. Aboard the Bowditch is Dr. Robert Ballard, a geologist from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Massachusetts. And, uh, our experience has shown that this is probably some of the roughest terrain we've ever encountered. Our major interest is the boundary between the, the two plates. All stations sonar to radiate. The Bowditch houses one of the most sophisticated sonar systems in the world. Every 12 seconds, a sonar beam sweeps the bottom beneath the ship. This signal bounces off the rugged, complex sea floor and returns to the ship where it is registered. This information is combined with navigational data to produce an amazingly accurate map of the sea floor over which the ship is passing. With each pass of the ship, a new strip of the seafloor is revealed. Slowly, the map is completed. We've crossed the Rift Valley, and it appears on some of the larger maps that we've crossed some volcanoes. And we've blown up a particular area of the Rift Valley. And sure enough, as you can see, right down on the valley floor are these round objects that look very much like volcanoes. As the survey nears completion, a final map of the area is made. This map will guide the next phase of the investigation. This phase calls for the NOR, a research vessel belonging to the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Orbiting satellites are used 
to fix the Norse position precisely. There are no natural reference points in a world of endless horizons. When the Nor is positioned over the rift valley below, its huge steel camera sled is lowered over the side. The sled is quickly lowered several thousand meters to the bottom. With the crew monitoring the sled's progress, the camera photographs the bottom at 10 second intervals. Twelve hours later, the camera sled is hauled in. It bears the scars of its collisions with the craggy bottom, but the camera is undamaged and its roll of film is developed immediately. That night, a review of the film confirms the presence of young lava flows in the valley floor. Unlike those on land, these look much like pillows. Now that a promising site has been located exactly, the final phase of the study commences. For this work, the submarine Alvin is brought to the study site aboard its support ship, Lulu. Preparations for a dive begin early in the morning with a thorough checkout of the submarine. All systems must be inspected and approved before the dive can begin. Food and equipment for the sub's three-man crew goes inside. The tiny titanium sphere is only about two meters or six feet in diameter. Outside is a mechanical arm for collecting rock samples. All checks are completed. The launch can begin. Man your launch stations. Man your launch stations. The elevator holding the sub is lowered between the two hulls of the catamaran Lulu. The time has come for Alvin's crew to come on board. Lines attached to Alvin enable line handlers to guide the sub out from between Lulu's hulls. Once Alvin is clear of the support ship, divers remove the lines and the sub is on its own. Uh, this is Lulu, uh, Roger. Depth of water, 3500 zero, zero meters. Permission granted to dive. Have a good one. Over. Roger, diving. Flooding our air tanks, we slowly descend. The rolling motion of the sea stops, and the noise of the surface is replaced by a peaceful silence. Our descent to 9,000 feet, or just under 3,000 meters, will take an hour and a half to complete. Alvin touches down on a level part of a staircase-like cliff that rises some two kilometers above the seafloor. The terrain here is older, 
covered by a thick blanket of mud that has accumulated like snow on a rocky alpine slope. As the submarine navigates toward the volcano, a rarely seen octopod glides into view. Its unusual fins, which look like ears, help it to swim. The octopod is more than a meter long. It seems perfectly at home in the near freezing temperatures, crushing pressure, and total darkness of the deep. One of Alvin's most important tasks is collecting rock samples from the bottom. It looks like the, uh, the nature of the outcrop's changing. It looks like we've gone from that massive outcrop to that more, you know, that brecciated one we saw in the last dive. Yeah, it looks like you. That's the outcrop we'd like okay. to work on. Huh? Okay, you see it? Yeah, that's just right about there, right underneath that, uh, that white sea anemone. Yeah, I'm bringing the arm around. Okay, see the arm yet? Yeah. Yeah, okay. just coming into view. Okay. Let me have you in there. Okay. Just a small one, you know, like a fist-sized sample or something. Okay, I got it. You got it? Got it. Got it. Okay. All right, here we go. Yeah, that's a beauty. Encounter fresh volcanic terrain as we near the center of the Rift Valley. Barren of sediment, its glassy outer surface is jagged and razor sharp. We climb the steep slope of the volcano, heading toward its summit. In the green glow of our thallium iodide lights, we can see the uncratered summit of the volcano. We have now reached the very center of the valley. It is here that magma welling up from deep within the earth ultimately reaches the surface. I try to imagine what it would be like if this volcano were to erupt. The volcano is quiet now, but the 20,000 kilometer long mid-Atlantic ridge is an active area where a volcanic eruption could occur any place any time. In the shallow waters off Hawaii, eruptions have taken place that give us a good idea of what the process of underwater volcanic creation looks like. Lava flowing into the sea quickly changes form. Rapidly cooled by seawater, the lava forms tubes through which molten magma travels. When it reaches the end of the tube, the magma pours into the sea, quickly hardening to form a new section of tubing. In this way, the volcano grows higher and advances across the valley floor, away from the central rifts from which it first flowed. Traveling along the crest of the volcano, the sub encounters few living creatures. These are plant-like animals scattered here and there that feed on food, raining down from the sunlight zone, thousands of meters above. In a region of few living creatures, the submarine inexplicably encounters a small area dense with life. Ghostly crabs crawl through thick shoals of brown mussels. But how can a community of life flourish at these depths, where no sunlight can penetrate, no photosynthesis take place, and no green plant life exist? What supports the food web? The answer has to do with the energy that fuels the volcano. Seawater circulating in newly formed cracks in the young volcanic terrain reaches down near the magma chamber beneath the volcano it feeds. 
heated and chemically altered by its interaction with the hot rocks below, this warm water rises back to the surface where it flows out of open vents. Bacteria able to metabolize chemicals in the warm water are the basis of the entire food web. This dense concentration of life is restricted to a small area around the warm water vent. When the water in the vent cools, all life will perish, except for individuals that make their way to a vent where warm water is still flowing and life is still possible. Before deep diving submarines took men to the sea floor, no one ever imagined that vents like these existed, and no one ever dreamed that life could exist at all at these depths. Station six, ready to leave the bottom. Exploring these vents in the young volcanic terrain of the valley continues to reshape our evolving concept of plate tectonics. Understanding our planet's remote past and foretelling its distant future. Learning how to find and use the Earth's resources. Predicting volcanic and seismic activity with the hope of moderating their destructiveness discovering how to live in harmony with our dynamic Earth. This is the promise of plate tectonics.